So, we've been talking for the last week or so about the Renaissance period and the Middle Ages. And we've been discussing how the Middle Ages had the feudal system. And when Charlemagne united all the small kingdoms, he also partnered up with the Catholic Church or the Pope, who was the leader of the Catholic Church, and really made the Catholic religion of Christian or the Christian Christian faith part of their society. And this continued throughout the Renaissance. As you saw in the, in the pictures last week, and many of you picked up on it, is that most of their stuff, or most of the artwork that you saw, were re religious paintings. Their view of certain things. Leonardo da Vinci had painted the Last Supper. Michelangelo pa painted the Sistine Chapel. And much, much more. Well, religion played such a role that the Catholic Church became dominant during this time. And with that, you have a particular situation that, that occurred, or an event that occurred, called the Protestant Reformation. Now with the Protestant Reformation, it was quite interesting. Because what many people don't, don't realize is that with the Catholic Church, their Holy Bible was written, or originally written in Latin. The only people who could read the Holy Bible were members of the clergy. These were the leaders of the Catholic Church. The Pope, Archbishop, Bishop, Priest, Monks, Friars. All of these people were the only ones who could read and translate the, Catholic, the, the Holy Bible. Which means that people were trusting them to translate it for them, to tell them what the verses of the Bible mean, to and teach them all about their faith and their religion. Well, this tended to be a particular problem. Because they were the only ones to be able to read the Holy Bible, many began to do what we call corruption. And what I mean by that is many, many members of the clergy began to tell their followers not necessarily what was truthful and wanted to hear, but what was going to bring more money and more faith into the church. And what I mean by this is they would sell, indul uh, the sales of indulgences were just some of the corruptions that they would do. This, sales of indulgences, is basically paying money for a place in heaven. So you would go and trust your troubles and your sins to, to the clergy. And then they would tell you to ensure, to ensure your place, to have God forgive you or their God forgive you, then you must pay so much money. Now this is not only this is not even their taxes that they were having to pay to the lords and to the kings at the time. This was on top of everything else to ensure that their faith would would continue to support them. And this was the idea. The other thing that was happening is that many who could pay more money or higher contributions of money were given political and authoritative positions within society. Is this fair? No, not at all. This would be like me telling you that if you <clears throat> don't have 10 pencils, then you can't stay in the classroom because you don't have enough money to stay in the classroom. Because let's say we have a new bridge textbook, a new bridge policy book that's written in a different language. And I tell you that in this textbook that you can't read, by the way, I'm the only one that can read it. 
it says that you must have 10 pencils every day. And if you have, don't have those 10 pencils, you can't stay in the room. You can't stay at school. Now, you all think that's great and that's dandy and, you know, we'll go home and we won't chill about it and okay. But when it's dealing with your faith and your belief, that's not so much the case. And this is what would happen is people were paying higher prices to secure their faith and their belief because that's what the church was telling them. The same with the people who were paying for political authority or a political position or authority within society because they could pay money to the Catholic Church and the church would give them that authority. It's a little scary when you start to think about it that people could pay for it instead of actually earn it. Hmm. <clears throat> anyway, this corruption happened all over the world until one monk had studied enough, studied his faith, faith enough, studied the Bible enough, studied everything enough, that he realized and began to realize that the clergy were not necessarily treating the people of the society or of the followers of faith as fairly as the, as the people thought they were. And he didn't necessarily think that this was quite fair and that he took a risk. He took a huge risk in speaking out about this. How did he do that? Well, he wrote a thesis. Which, and a thesis is a written statement or an argument. And he wrote this thesis against the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the thesis was titled The 95 Thesis. Excuse me. Now, this thesis stated 95 things that he felt was wrong with the Catholic Church that the Catholic Church, not necessarily the church was doing, but what the clergy were doing. The faith was fine. It was the clergy that, that were telling everybody that something was wrong, or that he, is what he had wrong. So what did he do with this thesis? He sat down and he wrote it all out. But what did he do? He took a huge, huge risk. And on October 31st, 1517, he took his thesis and he nailed it to the local Catholic church doors. This broke all Catholic faith laws and went against the Catholic church. He is a monk and he took this risk knowing the repercussions that could happen. He could be exiled, he could be removed from the Catholic church, and he could possibly even be killed or possible death for his treason against his own faith. Now, what did the church do? Well, at first they denied everything that was stated in the thesis. And then they also sent out a search party for Martin Luther with, of course, a price for his, for his capture. Now, Martin Luther was eventually captured and he was brought to the Catholic Church, the leaders of the Catholic Church, to defend himself and his crimes. And they asked him, they asked him to take away his statement, to, to say that all of it was false and he was kind of out of his mind. And Martin Luther thought about it and he said, okay, I will take away the anger that I felt and the way I did it, but I will not take away what I said. He stood by what he stood, what he talked about. He stood by what he really and truly believed was wrong with the Catholic Church at the time. And again, that's a huge, huge risk. But if you have that belief, that, that strong, you can't turn your back on it. And he didn't. He refused when he was asked to take back his statement. Well, what happened? They didn't.
didn't kill him, although I'm sure it was discussed. But Martin Luther was exiled from the Catholic Church. And he still had a lot of friends, and one of them was a duke um, within the area. And he took refu ref refuge, excuse me, he took refuge in Wartsburg Castle, which is in Germany. And while he was there, he did a few things. He translated the Bible from Latin to German. So he actually sat down with the Bible, and he wrote out verse for verse, word for word, everything the Bible said in Latin into German. Well, this was the amazing part is because once he was done, he sent it to a printing press, which is this great invention. It was one of the first inventions of a mass production of <clears throat> words. This is where books and newspapers and magazines got their first start, was from this invention that would mass produce um, writings. And so with that, he was able to translate it from Latin to German, and print it out. And then more monks and more people who could read Latin or read German, excuse me, could then translate it to other languages. So now you have, you have a couple of cool things happening here. You have this man who is standing firm with his belief in his faith, willing to be exiled, from his religion for his belief. And then you have him taking his faith, his, the, his book of faith, translating it, and then allowing more people to read it. Because there were people who could read German. They couldn't read Latin. So now do they know the full truth of what the Holy Bible says? Yes, they do. And they could have more teachings. And then those people who could read German would then translate it into Italian. They would translate it into French. They would translate it into English. And you have a mass production of the Holy Bible. Well, the Holy Bible to this day is still one of the top mass produced books in the world. But the other thing that he did was he began a new branch of Christianity or of a Christian religion. <coughs> Which allowed for, oh geez, here we go. Okay. Which allowed for more branches of the Christian faith or faith or Christianity to branch off. Now, he just started Lutheran. And we already had Catholic. But then because of his revolt against the Catholic Church, we also got Anglican, Baptist, and Methodist, plus so many more. And the spread of religion and the ideas of how religion can be the same and different also began to grow based on what Martin Luther had done during the Protestant Reformation. This will be a key factor in many things to come. The Renaissance period, the Middle Ages, all of this were building blocks for more things to come as we go through our history lessons.